Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends of Christ, I'm going to ask you a few questions this morning, and I just want you to raise your hands to let me know whether the situation you have experienced. First of all, how many of you have had a black and white TV? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you still have a black and white TV? Raise your hand. Do you still watch programs on that black and white TV? No. Okay. How many of you would prefer to watch a National Geographic program on a black and white TV or a 4K LED color TV? Raise your hand. How many of you would like to watch that National Geographic program on a black and white TV? Raise your hand. Okay, nobody's responding here. We got a problem. <laughs> if you watch the National Geographic program on a color TV, it's going to be more vivid. It's going to give you more details than a whole black and white TV, correct? Yes. And I think we would all probably agree we'd rather watch it on a color TV. Well, this morning, we are going to look at a familiar parable called the prodigal son. And we are going to look at it through the eyes of a first century Jew. What did that Jew hear when Jesus told that particular parable? Now, I can assure you, the majority of us turn around and we read the scriptures from a Western society, 21st century point of view. That's like looking at the scriptures through the black and white TV. If you get into the first century Jewish culture and you study the scriptures and look at what Jesus said from that Jewish culture, it's like looking and listening through that 4K LED color TV. So, We've got a lot of territory to cover. Let's get right into our text today. Let's look at some insights into this first century culture as we study the story. First of all, what's the youngest son's reaction? The youngest son's reaction is basically going to his father and saying, Dad, I want my share of the inheritance. And what is he saying to his father? Very simple. Father, I wish you were dead. That's what he was telling his father. You see, you don't receive an inheritance until the father dies. And when the father dies in this situation, since there's two sons, the oldest son would receive a double portion, and the youngest son would receive a single portion. In other words, one-third would go to the youngest son, two-thirds would go to the oldest son. But this youngest son turns around and has such a disgraceful request to his father. He shames his father. And because of that request, his father had every right to beat him. Yeah, now parents, listen, don't try that today. You turn around, you beat a child, you're going to be in a heap big trouble. Okay? But in first century Judaism, a father had every right to beat his son for such a disgraceful request. Give me my share of the inheritance. And what was the father's reaction? He turns around, he divides up his property amongst his two sons. 
The oldest son receives a double portion, two-thirds. The youngest son receives one-third of the property and the inheritance. Now, what's the oldest son's, the eldest son's reaction? Well, he should have openly refused to accept the property. But he doesn't. He doesn't refuse accepting it at all. He's going to take it. The older son should have stepped up in the role of reconciler. You see, whenever there is a problem between two individuals back in our culture, the one who is closest to those two individuals is supposed to turn around and have the two individuals sit down and they are to reconcile their differences. They're trying to work things out. And it was the responsibility of the oldest son to turn around and have his younger brother and his father to sit down to try to resolve this problem. But he doesn't do it. He doesn't do a thing. His silence is as shocking as the disgrace of his younger brother by asking for that, his share of the inheritance. We also have to talk about the community, the village around us. For you see, the community, the village, whatever happens to one, happens to all of them. The father was disgraced. He was shamed. That meant the entire community, the entire village was also shamed by the actions of that younger son. And so what happens? Several days later, the younger son takes everything that his father had given to him. He goes off to a faraway distant land. I can tell you that the distant land wasn't that far in our eyes. It was probably only five to seven miles away. If you see, he was a Jew and he lived in the region of the Jews. But he is going to go to the region of the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And how do we know that? What did he feed? When he ran out of money and ran out of food, he was hired out as a hired hand to feed pigs. Pigs were the sacrificial animals that the Gentiles offered up to their gods and goddesses. The Jews offered up lambs and sheep. And so this young man runs to a distant country, probably five to seven miles away. And there he lives a wild life. He finds new friends. He has new friends as long as he's got money. But when the money runs out, there's a famine in the land. And the friends leave. He's there starving, goes out looking for a job, and he's hired to feed pigs. Jews don't feed pigs. That's an unclean animal. Yet, he hired himself out and got a job. He comes to his realization. The servants in his father's household, they have food to eat. He'd go back to them, to his father. He decided that he would tell his father, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Hire me as one of your hired hands. And so he decides he is going to go back. He returns home. As he is getting close to home, as he's still a little distance off, his father turns around and sees his son returning. And what does the father do? He runs out to his son to greet him, to meet him. And the question we have to ask is, why? 
Well, first of all, it's because of his love for his son. What's interesting is no dignified man would run. He ran. Why would a dignified man run? Because running would have been looked upon as being shameful and a disgrace. He would end up showing his legs to the people around him. So why does he run? Very simple. He loves his son. But there's also another reason. That's probably the most important. He's got to get to his son before anyone in the community gets to his son. Why? Because the son is furious, or the community is furious with his son. They too were shamed by that young man when he shamed his father. And dad's got to run out there to get to his son before anyone in the community does. Because if they get to him first, they would have every right to kill him. As we continue, the father welcomes his son back. He turns around and he tells the servants, get a robe, put it on my son. Get this family ring, put it on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. Oh. The son had confessed to his father that he should be hired as a hired hand. But father puts sandals on his feet. Father isn't going to let his son be a hired hand. He's taken his son back. He is forgiving his son. How do we know? Slaves didn't wear sandals. Family members wore the sandals. He then throws a banquet. He throws a party. And what does he do? He's going to invite everyone in the community, everyone in the village, to join in the party. And what we have to remember is this. There's a meaning behind this whole thing. What's the meaning of eating with a person back in those days? Four things. If you take nothing away from my message this morning, just remember these four things. Because every time you come across eating in the Bible, think of these four ideas. What is the meaning of eating with another person? First of all, they are saying, we are the best of friends. Secondly, we forgive each other. Whatever wrongs we have done to each other, we forgive each other. Thirdly, we will never mention the situation ever again. It is forgiven, and we won't talk about it. Our lips are sealed. <clears throat> Finally, we love each other so much that we are willing to die for each other. <clears throat> That's what it meant to eat with a person back in that first century culture. Four things. We are the best of friends. We love each other. We forgive each other. We'll never bring the problem ever up again. And we love each other so much that we are willing to die for each other. Let's return back to the story. The older son. What's his reaction? He's out in the fields. He comes home. He hears singing and dancing going on. He asks the servants what's going on. And he is told that his father is throwing a banquet. What? Does he go in? No. 
the older son shames his father by not going in. So what happens? He hasn't done it for his brother. He does not forgive his brother. So what happens? The father shames himself. By leaving all of his guests that are attending the banquet, and he goes out to his older son to reassure his older son he truly loves him and that everything he has belongs to his older son. But does the son go in? No. He invites his son to join him, but he doesn't go in. Now remember, when the banquet is over, everyone who attended that banquet, their lips are sealed. They can't mention that situation that took place between that father and his younger son ever again. They have accepted the younger son and they forgive the younger son for what he has done to his father and to them as the community and the village. Applications. What does this mean for you and for me? How do we apply it to our own daily life? Well, we have a heavenly father. God is our Heavenly Father. We have shamed Him. We shame Him every day through our sins. Sins of thoughts, words, and deeds. We shame our Heavenly Father. But He loves us. And what has He done for us? He has given us a meal. The Lord's Supper. And there he eats with us. For scripture tells us where two or three are gathered together in his name, he is in their midst. He is going to be with us this morning as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Now I ask you to remember this. Four things. Remember the four things? When you eat with a person, you are saying what? We are the best of friends. We forgive each other for what we have done. We will never bring the situation, the problems up, the sins up ever again, God says. We are forgiven. They are removed. They are washed away. He was willing to lay down his life for us. Through his son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus came into this world. He walked to a cross, hill called Calvary, and there he suffered and he died. That's how much he loves us. To die on our behalf. He forgives us. Never to turn around and bring those sins back to us ever again. That's love. I'm sure there are some things that we, you have seen and heard this morning from a first century Jewish perspective that you've never heard before. But do you see why I said that we're going to look at the scriptures through that first century culture? It's as if we are looking at a 4K LED TV, color TV, rather than a black and white TV. The message didn't change. It's a story of shame, a story of love, a story of grace. 
whether you want look at it through the 21st century Western society or whether you look at it through the first century Jewish culture. But when you look at it through the first century Jewish culture, it becomes more vivid and alive. And you start to see details that you have never seen before. I encourage you. If there's an interest in first century Jewish culture, <coughs> study it. If you're interested, talk to me following the service today. I've got all kinds of materials that I could give to you to help you on and aid you on that journey. But what I want you to remember is this. We are going to participate in a meal today. The Lord's Supper. God says, we are the best of friends. I love you. I forgive you of all of your sins. I'll never bring them back up to you ever again. And I willingly lay down my life for you. You are forgiven. Amen. The peace of God which passeth understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.